You're listening to Big World Network. Subprime Evil Episode 4 Where the Homeless Won't Go Part 1 Written by Robert S. C. Cutler Read by Ryan Jones Warning! Although there is no material subject matter within that couldn't be found in any general bookstore with no age constraint, this series is rated 18 and contains adult situations and content. The records vault in the basement of the downtown Wichita police station was cramped and void of windows. Fluorescent light fixtures hanging from wooden beams offered the only light in the drab and dusty, dungeon-esque room. Three desks, rows of metal shelves, and multiple stacks of boxes arranged by date covered every square inch of the floor space with the exception of narrow paths snaking around the clutter. Officer Clem Davis, gator to the rest of the force due to a pronounced underbite and crooked teeth, sat at his desk removing staples from stacks of documents while reading a dog-eared fantasy novel. Three tall cans of energy drink, two empty and one half full, stood adjacent to his desktop monitor along with an empty bag of cheese puffs. His police uniform, only six months old, was wrinkled and blotted with ink stains on his left shirt pocket. His pants were high at the ankles and the waist was tight from lack of exercise. The two officers Gator shared duties with were equally as lethargic. Stan Van Hauser was in his early 60s and just two years away from retirement. He was playing solitaire with an actual deck of cards next to a stack of papers he was supposed to have taken care of four hours earlier. Hector Valenzuela, 37, was kicked back in his chair, eyes closed, and listening to his iPod. Gator had always dreamed of being a police officer. His ambitions were finally realized after being laid off from Swiftjet, where he had been employed as a tool crib attendant for over five years. After long and vigorous training at the police academy, he graduated, last in his class, but made it on the force nonetheless. Due to his less-than-stellar beginning, he was placed down in the vault, otherwise known as the Dead End. That particular morning, he was about to get what he'd always wanted, a real assignment. "'Whose turn is it to pick up lunch?' Gator asked. "'Yours, I believe,' Stan said. Hector yawned. (sighs) "'Stan was Thursday and I was Friday, so Monday is your day, Gator.' Gator grinned and shook his head. "'Oh, yeah.' Deli, Mexican, or burgers? Taco Jack's has a value meal special going on, Stan said. Hector sat up and rubbed his eyes. Taco Jack's is cool with me. I'll start an order list. Sergeant Pope, early forties and looking every bit of sixty, came pounding down the metal stairs to the caged-off entrance to the vault. Christ! He waved his hand in front of his face. Why does it always smell like ass and corn chips down here? Not one of the three officers gave so much as a glance Pope's way. They had heard him carry on like this every day they had worked in the vault. Pope was the assigned supervisor to the group, but rarely was of any help. He would make his customary rounds, chat it up for 30 seconds or less, and then be out of sight and out of mind until just before lunch the following day. Hector, Pope said, rapping the metal gate with his fist. Got an assignment for you topside. Up and at him. You know I have work restrictions. Hector said, clutching his back with both hands. I'm not supposed to do much more than sit at this desk. Stan Van Hauser looked up at Pope and shook his head. Me too, Sarge. Sergeant Pope cast a weary gaze on Gator. Come on, Gator. I guess that means you're up. Really? Gator gave a toothy smile. Put down your sci-fi book and report to room 22B for your briefing. Actually, it's a fantasy novel. I don't give a rat's ass if it's gone with the wind. The lieutenant is expecting you now, Pope growled as he walked away. Excited at the chance to get out of the basement and to be part of the real force, Gator jumped up from his chair and knocked over the half-full can of energy drink all over his paperwork and his uniform slacks. Holy buckets, look what I did. Don't sweat it, Gator. You were going to shred them anyway, Hector said. But my pants... Use these, bro. Hector tossed Gator a stack of napkins from a fast food restaurant. Does that mean you're not getting lunch today? Asked Stan. Yup, Hector answered. Your turn, Grandpa. 
Gator ran up all three flights of stairs and into room 22B, where Sergeant Pope and Lieutenant Abbott were waiting for his arrival. The lieutenant looked Gator up and down, shook his head, and then gave Pope a scowl. A third officer entering the room blurted out a laugh and covered his mouth in a futile attempt to control himself. Good God Almighty, this is all you could find, the lieutenant said. Pope looked away from the lieutenant. Yes, sir. Fortunately, it's a meaningless assignment anyway, the lieutenant sighed. Have you been reading up on the homeless population decline in Wichita, Officer Davis? Just back page stuff in the paper, said Gator. Is this like a murder investigation? What? No, the lieutenant yelled. Where did you get that cockamamie idea from? Just a hunch? No hunches, Gator. This isn't TV, Pope said. Just follow the directions on the cover sheet and hand it in by Friday, close of shift. Lieutenant Abbott handed Gator a manila envelope full of questionnaires. You are to canvas Riverside, Delano, and the downtown areas close to the rivers. You will only interview the homeless population to see if they know anything about their friend's departure from Wichita, and no one else. Clear? Gator eagerly took the envelope. Yes, sir. The lieutenant continued. I don't know why anybody would care if their numbers are down. Hell, so are the crimes they usually commit. I say good riddance to them all. Let Oklahoma City or Dallas have them. I'll do my best, sir, Gator said. Good. We'll touch base one week from today. Without a glance their way, the lieutenant walked by Gator and Pope and out of the room. Pope watched his boss leave and exhaled. Oh, and Gator, you don't have to report to the vault anymore this week. And for Pete's sake, go home and change that nasty uniform of yours. I could smell you coming up from two flights down. Gator pulled up to Riverside Park, just west of downtown Wichita, in his 1992 Honda in the same uniform he had put on that morning. He got out of the car and stretched, dropping his clipboard with the stack of questionnaires in the process. The warm sun felt good on his pale skin and the fresh air in his lungs. Given the opportunity to get out of the records vault and prove he could do more than file and shred paper, he didn't mind that Sergeant Pope wouldn't issue him a revolver or even a squad car. He was happy to be armed with a pin and his reliable old clunker. The park was full of moms, dads, kids, geese, and a few joggers, but not one homeless person. Gator walked over to the zoo cages and restrooms, hoping to find some sitting in the shade like they usually did, but only found a young couple pushing their baby around the block of animal enclosures. Gator was more nervous about the assignment than he thought he would be. Having limited contact as a police officer with the civilian population, he just wasn't as sure of himself. He took a deep breath to work up some courage and approached. Good morning, folks, Gator gave his usual toothy grin. Startled by the interruption, the couple looked Gator up and down, trying to figure out if he was for real or not. Can we help you with something, uh, officer? The man asked. Attempting to look professional, Gator cleared his throat and spoke in a monotone. Yes, actually, you can. I'm looking for individuals who are homeless. Um, I mean homeless people. The couple didn't answer. The man stared at the short, goofy-looking and poorly-dressed cop, then shared a glance with his wife. The woman squinted at Gator. Do you mean, are there any homeless people in the park? Yes, Gator enthused, causing the couple to jump. Have you seen any? Not in this park, the man answered. There haven't been any for about two weeks. It's really nice, the woman added. We don't have to worry about being approached or feeling safe using the restroom. The park is a lot cleaner, too, the man said. Have you tried the park by the arena on Douglas? There's usually a bunch of them there. Gator scribbled on his notepad the words arena, park, and Douglas. Thank you, folks, for being of service. The Wichita Police Department thanks you also. He turned to walk away. I'm hot on the trail, he said to himself. Gator pulled into the parking lot of an abandoned business set between the arena and the park on Douglas. As the couple had said, there were quite a few homeless people hanging about. He took a deep, nervous breath and started toward a small group, causing them to scatter at the sight of his blue uniform. Three older men didn't move. What do we have here? said a black man wearing a faded army fatigue jacket. Inspector Gadget? The other two laughed. A tall, skinny man with a scarred left eye and long, wispy gray hair folded his arms and glared down at Gator. Free world, officer. We ain't moving. The other two joined in the stare down. 
Of course you're not. Our city's wonderful parks are for everyone's enjoyment. Gator smiled and nodded his head. I'm just here to ask a few simple questions. He took a pin out of his stained shirt pocket and got ready to write. The man in uniform, what is your name? Nunya, said the man wearing the fatigue jacket. That's a peculiar first name. Oh, you like that? Well, then my last name must be Damn Business. Gator fidgeted nervously. No need to be difficult. We're just having a friendly conversation here. Army Jacket looked Gator up and down. Where's your gun, little dude? He's not old enough to have one, said the man with the scar. Oh, big enough, said the third man. His face was dirty and well tanned. Beads of sweat dropped down Gator's pronounced forehead. Large oval stains formed at his armpits. He wilted under the assault, glancing longingly back at his old clunker. Then he remembered the vault and how humiliating it would be to return to the precinct without his simple task being accomplished. He breathed out slowly and started to write on the questionnaire. No need for names. Mr. Army Jacket can be number one, Gator said. Scarface punched Tan Man in the arm. I guess that makes you number two. Gator scribbled out the number one and wrote down A instead. You three will be A through C. The three men smirked and nodded. Now, Mr. A, have you noticed a decline in the homeless population this year? Gator asked Army Jacket. What kind of question is that? He replied. Gator cleared his throat and read from his information packet. According to the city, the homeless population has decreased by a significant amount west of and in the downtown area of Wichita. So maybe they got jobs, said Scarface. Gator squinted and thought out loud. But that doesn't explain Riverside Park. Army Jacket crossed his arms and took a step toward Gator. What about Riverside Park? There's only normal folks there. I didn't see any homeless people at all. Oh, so we're not normal, said Tan Man. Gator blinked at them, not sure what to say. Army Jacket shoved his hands into his pockets and walked a few steps away, then turned back around. Nobody goes there anymore. That's cause it's freaking haunted, Tan Man said, pointing a finger at Gator. Full of demons. I think it's Bigfoot myself, Scarface said. Army Jacket shook his head. Ain't no demons or Bigfoot. It's something else. Some kind of creature. I've seen the damn thing. Yeah, both you and James, but he hasn't been around for a couple of weeks, said Scarface. Army Jacket looked down at the ground. He ain't never coming back. Probably still in the river if he wasn't eaten. Taken aback by what Army Jacket just said, Gator stopped riding and cocked his head to the side. Eaten? Eaten by what? Frustrated, Army Jacket looked up to the sky. Haven't you been listening to a damn thing we're trying to tell you, little dude? There's something evil in that park, in the river. I'm not sure what I saw that night, but it ain't natural. Goosebumps arose on Gator's arms. He eyed them doubtfully. He had been lied to and tricked so many times in his life, he just didn't know when anyone was telling the truth. You think an animal ate this James person? Not sure it was an animal, Army Jacket said. All I know is that it had glowing eyes like a cat or a dog and a real low growl. It scared me, so I took off. Then I heard James screaming for help. The next thing I see is his body being dragged into the river and something big thrashing about in the water. I ran as fast as I could, all the way to the mission, and haven't returned since. Did you call the police? Gator asked. Hell no, Army Jacket yelled. I'm not about to go to jail, especially for no murder I didn't commit. So your friend might still be in there, Gator asked. Only his body, the James I knew, is in heaven. Where? Check by the bridge on the south side of the park. You better go and buy yourself a gun, officer, Scarface said. You might run into Bigfoot. Tan Man laughed. Yeah, Bigfoot. Scared but excited, Gator ran back to his car, leaving the three men standing there. Discovering the body might be his ticket into the real world of being a cop. He drove as fast as he could back to Riverside Park. He parked, then looked around for the bridge where the remains of the homeless man James might be. He ran across the grass and then past Stackman Court and Nim Street, but all he found were a few geese and some debris collecting against the bank and underside of the bridge. Not wanting to give up, Gator made his way down toward the riverbank and bridge. His black dress shoes sank deep into the muck and mud, 
slurping and popping with each step. At one point, his foot came out of his left shoe. He clumsily tried to slip it back on, only to lose the balance and sink, sock and all, into the slimy riverbank. As he drew closer to the bridge, Gator saw what looked like a white cotton shirt floating in the water. Alongside it, and caught up in the debris, was a single tennis shoe. He picked up a long branch from the river's edge and reached out toward the shoe, trying to hook it. He fumbled at it, flipping it over and causing it to tumble into the water and float away. Frustrated, Gator then tried for the shirt. As he lifted it out of the water, he revealed the upper section of a human ribcage connected by tissue and tendons to an almost stripped right arm. Repulsed and frightened, Gator screamed and dropped the carcass back into the river. Music by Kevin McLeod. You're listening to Big World Network.